This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Tonight, what is on my heart, and I I don't know who it will be for, but I know it's for somebody. Because there's somebody in here that's saying, Now, Lord, I don't understand why you answer that person's prayer, but you don't answer my prayer. Lord, I don't understand why you move in that person's life, but you don't move in my life. And I'm so thankful that you're here tonight, and I hope that this will help you and Maybe open up something in your soul. But tonight my question for you that you're asking is, what is blocking your blessing? In Job chapter number 42, I'm looking tonight in verse number 7. In the book of Job chapter 42, verse number 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliaphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, And go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept. Lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Now get that in your mind. What did God just tell them? He said, you better go ask Job to pray for you because you are not right with me. And until Job prays for you, you aren't going uh, just a foot further. Now here is the problem with that. Look at what it says in verse number 9. So Eliaphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. That word accepted, it means to forgive. The Lord also forgave Job. All right, we're building on something here. Stick with me now, lest my mind run ahead of me. So we've got a problem. Job and his friends, and his friends can't pray for themselves. God won't listen to them. That's in this hand. Then right here in the middle, we find out that when Job does this, God's going to forgive Job. Forgive him for what? Well, remember what Job had just done for the last several chapters. He had questioned God and accused God and wondered about what God was doing in his life. And God looks at Job and he says, let me ask you something, big boy. You've been telling me you don't think I'm right. You've been telling me you don't think I'm in this thing. Let me ask you a question, Hoss. Where were you when I put Orion's belt in the sky? 
Where were you when the sons of the morning sang together at the creation of the world? If you think you're so right, do me a favor. Go up there and tell Orion to unlatch his belt. Go tell the angels to sing another creation song. Why don't you go ask Leviathan to swim through the ocean at your disposal? If you're so big and bad, so the friends can't pray for themselves. And when Job does this action... God's going to forgive him. Now look at what verse number 10 says. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Brothers and sisters, tonight, from the beginning of Job chapter 1 to the end of Job chapter 42 is a period of one year. It's been one year since Satan went to heaven. It's been one year since in heaven Satan looked at God and said, You know Job serves you because you do good things for him and you've given him good things. It's been one year since God told Job, take everything from Job, or it's from, to Satan, take everything from Job, take his health, take his family, take his wealth, don't touch his life. And for one year, Job has had to deal with that oppression. And for one year, Job has had to deal with that sickness. And for one year, Job has had to deal with all of that turmoil. And if that wasn't bad enough, his comforter in chief show up long about the time that the last boil pops up on his flesh. He's got three friends that pop up, and I mean these friends are real jewels in the crown. I mean, they are real blessings in the post. They are real excitements in the way. They are real wonderful people to be around. In fact, one of them was so wonderful what he said to Job. He said, Job, if you really love God, this would not have happened. And if that wasn't bad enough, then another friend stands up and says, Well, Job, you know, evidently there's unconfessed sin in your life. And that's why God has done to you what he's done to you. And if that's not bad enough, he steps over to the last friend. And the last friend looks at him and says, Joe, can I tell you the real reason that you're going through this? It's because you're a big fat hypocrite and the real Job has really come out. And Job has had to deal with oppression. Job has had to deal with discouragement. Job has had to deal with lies against him. Job has had to deal with people coming against him. Job has had to, my God, I feel this in my soul right now. He's had to deal with all of this wrong. He's had to deal with all of this pressure. He's had to deal with all of these people that are oppressing him but for one year he doesn't get a word from God for one year God never speaks to him for one year God never answers his prayer for one year God never listens to one thing Job says can you imagine going one year some of you can some of you, it's been a long time since you feel like God has really put the full force of who He is behind you. For some of you, it's been a long time since you really feel like God has done a work and you're looking just like Job. And Job looks and he knows that he hasn't done anything wrong. He knows that he didn't cover his young in sins. He knows that he's not really a hypocrite. He knows that God has really put him where he is and he looks at all of this and he says, God, why are you blocking my blessing? God, why are you coming against me? Aren't these the men that are speaking lies? Aren't these the people that have done wrong? Aren't these the ones that have hurt me? And God looks at Job and he never answers Job. He never hears Job. He never gives Job anything for one solid year. And Job looks up and says, God, why are you blocking my blessing? God, where are you? And for one year, silence. For one year, the only thing Job hears is the crackling of the ashes off of the fire from yesterday's sacrifice. And then all of a sudden, God thunders down. And from chapter 38 all the way to chapter number 41, God begins to speak to Job. He begins to correct Job. He begins to tell Job why it is he's done what he's done. Now, here's what you've got to understand. You and I have got the privilege of having all 42 chapters. When Job was in this and Job was living in this, Job didn't have the next chapter. Job didn't know the end of the story. Job didn't know what this thing was going to turn out like. Job did not know that in chapter number 42 he was going to get everything back. He didn't know in chapter number 42 he was going to get it all back plus some. He didn't know that God would double his blessing. He didn't know 
the end of the story. Number two, Job did not see the events in heaven. Not one time did Job ever see Satan go before God. Not one time did God, Job ever see God say, that's my boy and he's holy and he's right and he really is doing good and that's why I've let this thing. And for one year, Job didn't have all those answers. And for one year, Job did not know what was going on. That's where some of you are at right now. You are in that place and you're saying, God, I know you want me to go in this direction. I know you're trying to push me in this direction, but I feel like my blessing has been blocked. I feel like that I'm not getting anywhere. And God, where are you? Here's what you don't see. You don't see the end of the story. You don't see how this whole thing's going to turn out for your good and for God's glory. You don't see how this whole thing is going to work for the glory of God Almighty. You don't see how it's all going to come together and you don't see the events in heaven. You don't see how your heavenly Father has looked down at you and as Satan has come before him and has said, have you considered this person? Have you considered that person? You know what God's doing? God didn't put you in the furnace of affliction because you're a bad child. He put you in the furnace of affliction because he's a child. You're a child that he can trust. You're not in that fire because you're going to melt. He put you in that fire because he knew you could survive the heat that was coming your way. He didn't put you in that fire because he knew you'd flake off. He put you in that fire because he knew he'd put you on the potter's wheel. He knew he'd had his hands on your life. He knew that he'd put you in that water. He knew he'd had you in that place long enough and you were ready for the fire and you can't see all that and you're looking and you're saying, God, why are you blocking my blessing? Didn't they do wrong? Wasn't it them that messed up? Wasn't it them that did all this? Wasn't it them that put me through that? Wasn't it them that put me there? Why are you blocking my blessing? Watch what happens. Verse number 10. Watch when God turned the whole thing around. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. When Job prayed for the very ones that oppressed him. When Job was willing to pray for the ones that put him in the fire. When Job was willing to pray for the very ones that did to him what he could not get out of. When Job prayed for his biggest blisters. When Job prayed for his biggest burdens. And when Job prayed for the one that had done this to him. That's when God turned the captivity of Job. Let me give you three things. Number one, tonight I don't have a good word, but I do have a convicting word. I do have a strong word, and I do have a freeing word. If God can ever get you to the place in your Christian walk where you will pray for the very people that tried to break you, if you can get in your Christian walk where you will pray for the very people that tried to destroy you, if you can get in your Christian walk to where you will pray for those people that have tried to bring you down and destroy your life and to tear you to pieces, that's when God turns the captivity of His people. It's when we pray for those that have tried to destroy us. Let me show you number one if I can. Let me show you the the captivity of Job. Job is in a proverbial prison. Job is in a place of proverbial lockdown. Now here's what you got to understand. Job's in a place where he can't feel God. Job's in a place where he can't sense God. Job's in a place where he doesn't know how to get a hold of God. Job's in a place where he can't pray to God. Job feels like he's in a prison. What put Job in that prison? Here's what you've got to understand. It was not the trial that put Job in that prison. It was not the pain that put Job in that prison. Ladies and gentlemen, God will never put something on you that will destroy you. God will never put you in something that will bring you down. Here's what put Job in prison. Because he is in a prison. He can't get a word into God. He can't get a blessing coming back his way. Number one, he is Actions put Job in that prison. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, here's exactly what happened. When all of this comes his way, in walked these three big blessings into his life. And what those three big blessings did to him, they put him down, they beat him down, they talk him down, they look him down, everything they can do. They tear his life out from under him. They tear his heart out from inside of him. And if it doesn't get bad enough, when he's beat down, they put their proverbial heel in his throat and just twist. You know what Job looked at them and said? 
He said, let me tell you something. You talk to me that way, let me tell you about you. He said, you think you're so big and bad? I know what you've been like. You think you're wonderful? Let me tell you what you are really like. And you know what Job did? Job sunk down to their level. And it was his actions that put Job in prison. Can I tell you something? We all go through bad stuff. You got bad stuff. I got bad stuff. Barney's got bad stuff. Laura Lee Hobbs has got bad stuff. Andy's got bad stuff. Aunt B's got bad stuff. Everybody in Mayberry's got bad stuff. We all got stuff we deal with. Some of us have got stuff up here. Some of us got stuff in here. Some of us got stuff in here. But we all got stuff. If you live in this world long enough, you can't stop stuff from coming your way. You can't stop stuff from coming to your house. You can't stop stuff from coming into your marriage. You can't stop stuff from coming into your kids. You can't stop people from putting you through stuff. How many honest Baptists in the house wave at me and say, I know what that kind of stuff you're talking about. Some of you, it's the stuff of divorce. Some of you, it's the stuff of family squabbles. Some of you, it's the stuff of kids running aside. Some of you, it's the stuff of people betraying you. But we all got stuff and nobody can ever escape stuff. But here's what you can't escape. Your reaction to the stuff that's been done to you. Can I tell you something? The furthest thing from the plan of God is when bad is done to you when you look at them and say all right. You do that to me. Let me show you what I can do to you. All right, you want you want to you want to you want to take the gloves off? Oh, Mama can. T- I've heard that line more times in my life from Christian people. Oh, they want to take the gloves off. I'll take the gloves off too. You know what that'll leave everybody with? Bloody noses and broken hearts. At some point, somebody's got to say, "I'm sorry." You can slap me until I bleed out of both ears and eyes. I'm not slapping back. What did Jesus say? How many times? He said, if they slap you, turn the other cheek. I've heard Christians all my life try to outweigh that, outdo that, and outtalk that. They say, well, you don't have to take everything. You don't have to hang around. No, you don't. But I'll tell you what you do have to do. You have to turn the other cheek. You do realize there's only two things in this world the devil can never duplicate. It's true love and true forgiveness. And when someone looks at you and does to you what they do, you do realize they didn't put you in prison by their action. It was your response that put you in prison. The reason you can't get a prayer through is not because of what was done. It was because of how you responded. You know what else put him in prison? His attitude. Job's attitude put him in prison. Can you imagine getting so bad? Now, can we just be real good right now? We're going to be real hypocritical Baptists, and we're going to judge Job. Are you ready? Here, can you believe that he would get so bad? Can you believe he could get so hurt? Can you believe that he could get so wrong that he would look up to God? He would say to God, God, how could you let this happen? I can't believe somebody would get to that point. Now, can we be real honest Baptists? How many of us have ever looked up to God and said, God, how could you be letting this happen to me? You know what God said whenever he said that? He looks at God. He says, God, how could you let that happen? How do you know? God, how do you know this is what's best? And God looks at Job. He says, let me ask you something, pal. Who do you think you are? You do realize it was me that created the angels in the very beginning. It was me they were singing to. It was me that the stars dance in the sky to. It was me that put all this together. And you're going to look at me? Ladies and gentlemen, it's never wrong to ask God why. It's never wrong to say, Lord, why? Why? It is wrong to say you were wrong. It is wrong to look at God and say, there's no way this works out right. If you are in that prison right now, you put yourself there and I put myself there. Number two, the captivity of Job. Number two, what about the chains that were on his oppressors? What about the chains that were on the three friends and then the fourth friend that had his back? Now, I want you to get your mind around where Job's at. He's looking around at all these friends around that campfire. And God looks at Job. You realize God never dealt with the friends until he dealt with Job. 
He deals with Job and he looks at Job and he says, Son, me and you got to have a little chit chat. How many of you had them friends that you grew up with? And they're the ones that got you to do something bad? And your mama wore your tail out. Because I'm going to tell you something. I dealt with that in my family. I was abused. That's why I am like I am. I was abused. My cousin, my cousin, I'm going to tell you something. I love my cousin. But that fool got me in more trouble. He one time dared me, dared me to do something stupid with this stupid basketball. I ain't going to tell you what I did. Jesus has put it under the blood. <laughs> ain't no need the devil bringing that thing back out. My cousin is older than me. He told me I wouldn't get in trouble. So on top of tempting me, he lied. So you know, I ain't never been one to turn down a good dare. And if you double dog dare me, we're going to town, hoss. And so I did it. You know what that fool, first thing he did, he run back to my grandmother's house. Granny, 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 granny. Tyler, 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 Tyler. And you know what my grandma did? She looks at me. She said, tell me what you just did. You know what I said? I said, he told me to do it. She said, I ain't worried about him right now. I'm worried about you. That's exactly how it feels like sometimes when God will deal with you. It was them that left the marriage. It was them that did this. It was them that did the problem. It was them that did the abuse. It was them that took the money. It was them that's causing all the problems. It was them. God, why are you dealing with me? You do understand God's not just dealing with you. You've got to understand where these friends are. Can I show you something in verse number 7? God looks at the people that wrong His people. And he says three things to them. Number one, can I show you? In verse 7, he says this. He says, I see them. In verse number 7 of this chapter, watch what he says. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words to Eli, uh, spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, my wrath is kindled against thee. Brothers and sisters, you've got to understand something in your mind. You've got to understand something in your heart. I know it looks like the wicked are prospering. I know it looks like the enemy is going to win the battle. I know it looks like they're never going to be punished. I know it looks like that wrong is never going to be uncovered. I know it looks like all of that. But God looks at them and He says, Don't you worry about them. I see them. Because the very excuse, I can tell I'm hitting on something right now. The, the very excuse we will use as to why we will not do what God tells us to do is we say, Lord, why are you dealing with me? What about them? God says, don't you worry about them. Number one, I see them. Number two, I will repay. God says, I will repay. Look at what he says in verse number 7 of chapter 42. He says this. He says, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right. He says, My wrath is against you. There's a verse you need to remember all the days of your life. Romans 12, 19. Romans 12, 19. Watch what the Bible says. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will re. Pay. Brothers and sisters, when Paul writes that, he's writing it to the Roman believers that are being thrown into Roman Colosseums, being eaten by lions, thrown and burned on stakes and poles, burned alive in front of their children. And God tells through Paul, he tells that church, he says, don't you try to get revenge. I will. But we're good Christians, aren't we? We're, we're all good believers. I know there's good believers in this room. We don't out and out try to kill them. 
We don't try to shoot anybody. We're not trying to impale anybody. I've been in a few counseling sessions where I do fear that that was an option for somebody. But I can't say that that's ever come to pass. Where we try to repay is with our actions. It's how we try to shortchange people. It's the little snide comments we make around the corner. It's the way we hold things back. It's we show when we get around them that we really are in charge. God said, don't worry about them. I will repay. And third thing he says, in verse number 8 he says this, he says, oh, I see them, I will repay. And number 3, I want to forgive them. I want to forgive them. I want you to look in verse number 8 of this chapter. Now, beloved, listen, this one's going to go over like a lead balloon, but if you'll let this sit in your heart, I promise you it'll percolate in the glory of God. Look at verse number 8. Watch what he says. He says, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept. Watch this next word. Lest I deal with thee. You know what God says? He says, boys, go make this right. Don't you let this go a day further. I want to forgive you. Just like God wanted to forgive Job, God wants to forgive the three friends. Just like God wanted to make it right with Job, God wanted to make it right with the three friends. Just like God loved Job, He loved those three friends. Now, brothers and sisters, listen. you got to take the human element out of what I'm getting ready to tell you. I know people have wronged you. I know you've walked through the afflictions and the fires. I know you've been through the tribulations. I know people have wronged you and hurt you. But what you've got to understand Take all of that hate out of your heart. Take the lens of hate and wrath out of your mind and look at them for what they are. They are souls for whom Christ died. And God loves them just as much as He loves you. He wants to forgive them as much as He wants to forgive you. Now I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me and you're saying this. You're saying, now you just stop right there. You don't know what they did to me. I know that. How could God ever want to forgive them for for, for breaking a marriage? I know it's bad. I don't belittle it. How could God ever want to forgive them for running your nose in the ground? How could God ever want to forgive them? I know you've never done anything as bad as that. You didn't break a marriage up. You didn't mess that family up. You didn't do that over there. You didn't wrong them. No, we didn't do that. But I'll tell you what you and I did do. We took the darling Son of God out of the palaces of heaven, brought Him down to this earth. And when God gave His Son in the fullness of time, born of a virgin, born under the law, we took that son and we put him on a Roman cross and we striped him with a Roman cat of nine tails and we put a Roman crown of thorns on his head and we stripped him naked in front of God and everybody and on that pole we didn't give him any pain medicine we didn't give him any water we put myrrh and vinegar in his mouth and then when he did that we looked in his face and we laughed at him and we said if you really are the king of the Jews come down off of that pole brothers and sisters it was into that scene the Lord Jesus Christ looked at that and he said Father Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And if our Father was willing to forgive us for nailing the Prince of Glory to a cross, I think you and I can look beyond and say, God, if you forgave me, you want to forgive them for what they did. Can I tell you, the only thing that keeps you and I from wanting to see people forgiven is our own pride. We want to show people we were right. God looks at you and he says, just give it time. Truth will come out. Now here's the question. I'm looking at number three and I want to spend just a second on this. I don't have much time. But number three, what's the code that unlocks the door to blessing? What is the code that locks the door to blessing? It was found in verse 10. When Job prayed for his friend. That's when the Lord turned his captivity. Three things happened when Job prays. Number one, the wall was lifted. 
The wall was lifted in verse number 9. The Bible says, when Job did this, the Lord also accepted Job. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been in that place where you feel like there is something between you and God? You feel like there's a wall between you and God? You feel like you can't get your prayer through that titanium wall? You can't get your prayer through that brick wall? And I mean that, that wall is there. Here's what Job did. For one year, he felt that. One year every day, those friends talked to him. They berated him they belittled him and for one year one brick was put on top of another brick on top of another brick until finally the mortar of hatred had filled that thing up but one glorious day God thundered out of heaven and he said Job if you'll pray for them if you'll pray for the ones that hurt you and pray for the ones that belittled you and pray for their blessing if you'll pray for their blessing I will bless you that day he got on his knee and he looked up toward heaven and Job with scarred tissue on his arms and with a bald head and with no family or friends around he said oh God I pray for Eliphaz I pray for Bildad I pray for these men that have wronged me at the very time he began to pray you know what happened one one by one those bricks began to come down on that wall that had separated him and God you know what happened the good God of eternity he brought the wrecking ball of pyre when Job began to do what Jesus wanted him to do when he began to act like Christ that's when God started breaking the wall down why Why would God do that? Write this down and never forget this. You are never more like Jesus than when you pray for people that try to destroy you. Because our Lord is on the cross and it was those people that He looked at that nailed Him to the cross, split His side, pierced His head and He looks at them and He says, Father, please, just forgive them. They don't have any idea what they're really doing. When you get to the place in your life where the Holy Ghost has so worked in your soul where you can look at the people that have so wronged you and you could say, God, bless them. Bring them close to your side. I'm not talking about those prayers we like to pray. Now, Lord, show them how wrong they were. Lord, break them down like a double-barreled shotgun. No. When through tear stained eyes you can look up to heaven and say, Lord, I want to thank you that you forgave me. Now, Lord, would you forgive them too? Lord, I want to thank you for how you blessed me with all those sheep and all those goats and all those oxen and all those servants. Would you bless them with that? To those of you that have gone through the pain of divorce. When you get to the place. When you can look at the former. And say Lord. Let them love you. With all of their heart. God draw them close to your side. And the person. Forgive them Lord. You watch the bricks start coming off of that wall of anger. Watch the bricks start being removed from that anger, that bitterness, that wrath in your soul. He says, number one, the wall will lift. Number two, the weight will lift. Watch what it says in verse 10. It says, and God turned the captivity of Job. All of that pain that you're dealing with right now and all of that weight that you deal with every day of your life it's a burden that you carry around like a sack of bricks but when you look at God and you say God you see here's the problem the last step in true forgiveness is when you want that person to be just as right with God as you are right now that's the last step in true forgiveness True forgiveness starts with realizing you don't deserve it. The second step to true forgiveness is when you say, I'm not going to let them have this power over me. The third step is when you say, God, draw them nigh to you. You watch what God will do. All of a sudden, God begins to remove the bricks of anger out of Job's life. This happened to me several months ago. I was in my car. I was driving through the mountains going to preach somewhere. 
I was riding down through the road, and I'll never forget, I was praying for something, praying for something, and God brought this situation to my heart. And He brought this scripture to my heart. And for the first time in my whole life, for the first time since the situation happened, I began to lift up this person in this situation. And for the first time in my life, I felt God hear my prayer for that person. Within a day, I saw God turn the tide on a situation that I had been asking Him for in one day. You know why? Because God turned the captivity of Job when He prayed for His friends. Number three, the wasteland lifted. Look at what it says in verse 10. Miss Kim, will you put that up there? Verse number 10. And the Lord turned to the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Watch this last phrase. Also, the Lord gave Job how much? Okay, come on, I need some Pentecostal folk. What does it say? And the Lord gave Job how much? Stop. Job was holding on for over 38 chapters. What was he holding on for? He was trying to justify himself to get back what he lost. You know what God was wanting to do? God didn't want to give him back what he lost. God wanted to give him twice as much. You see that anger, that jealousy, that bitterness, that wrath. You're trying as hard as you can to hold on to what you lost to prove that you were right. And God, if you'll just do it God's way, you know what God's wanting to do? God's wanting to show you the way to double blessing. God's wanting to show you the way to double blessing. Everything Job lost, God said, I'm going to give it back plus some if you'll just do what I'm telling you to do. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the hardest thing that you'll ever do in your Christian walk is to find the person that tried to crucify you and ask God to forgive them. It'll be the hardest thing you'll ever do in your Christian walk. When you look at the people that rub your nose in it and you say, God, please bless them. If you ever want your blessing to be unblocked in your life, the only way to have a blessing unblocked is to pray. For those that wronged you. Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast on this station through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. We thank you for your faithful support. For more information, please visit tylergalden.com. To request the full sermon from this broadcast, call us at 833-FULL-JOY or write us at Unspeakable Joy, P.O. Box 4558, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27404. All of our sermons and other resources are available free of charge online at tylergalden.com. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.